The journey of an artist is non-linear. You will often feel unsure, exhausted, confused. This is the life of an artist. It is not necessarily something to embrace or to talk about at parties, but it is a truth with a capital T. Being an artist requires getting to know yourself, which is always an uphill battle. As you begin to learn who you are, who you are becomes who you were. So I want to share with you a bit of my story. It isn't my whole story, but it's some of the important beats, the ones that have helped me to remember who I am. I share this with you in part because I feel the need to remind myself of this story, this non-linear path, to remind myself that it's okay to not know where I'm headed. So let's start at the beginning. When I was 13, I got really interested in playing guitar. I didn't even have any particular goals at first. I, I just wanted to learn how to express. I remember wondering if I could ever get to a place in which plucking one note and letting it ring out could bring someone to sorrow or joy or fear. After a lot of years doing a lot of things, I now see that I was trying to understand abstraction, the measurement or quantum of abstraction. I started taking lessons, playing and listening and exploring, just trying everything out, and I could feel my mind expanding. And then my mom got me the 50th anniversary cut of Miles Davis's Kind of Blue. I was 16. She told me she had heard that some musicians call it a Bible of music. I put it on, curious, and it changed my life. There are so many different voices, so many types of expression in that recording. It was like a roadmap. I could see what I wanted out of music. I could observe what I felt drawn to and learn from that. Miles Davis is playing on that album still fires me up. It's so minuscule, so confidently less is more, and yet there's this deep, complex emotion in every single note that floats out of his trumpet. It was then that I dedicated myself to music, to jazz and theory and playing, to just figuring it all out. I didn't envision myself on a stage in front of thousands of fans too often. I just, I just felt hungry to learn. And I knew I had a lot of learning to do before I could start making, a lot of listening before I could start speaking. Now, let me stop here for a moment. As a child, I wrote and I made things up. I drew and I made noises with my mouth. I played pretend with friends and I was an adamant Lego builder. I actually wanted to work for Lego when I was extremely young, but somehow I never saw myself as an artist. I didn't think that I could be an artist. I see now that it was that I didn't think I was allowed to be an artist. There's a lot of relationship and health stuff wrapped up in that. And if you want to learn more about that, you can go listen to my first album. But all of this is to say that I didn't value my own expression. And I'm interrupting my story to remind you that parts of this are a cautionary tale. There are so many points in my life that I wish I could communicate with, but I was so distracted in my hope that one day I might be good, worthwhile, useful, that I never stopped to be vulnerable with myself, to share thoughts, worries, and dreams. Okay, so I was 18 when I first wrote a piece of music that I considered worthwhile. A friend's father, a local and beloved folk musician, died unexpectedly, and I felt drawn to write a piano piece in his honor. I wrote it, recorded it with the help of my dear friend Doug, mixed it down, put it on a CD, and gave it to his family. I felt purpose in capturing my feelings then, grief and sorrow and togetherness. That was the same year that I started assisting a sound engineer, pushing gear around and learning to plug cables in. Remember that, it will come into play later. That was also the same year that I started taking classes at university. As a teenager, I wanted to go to school for medicine. I remember being a kid and realizing that I'm smart and I'm quick and I can memorize stuff well and I'm really good in emergency situations. And I felt that it was my responsibility to go into a field where I could give back since I had this gift and it would be a horrible thing to waste. I was 18 and I had just started my first semester as a pre-med student and I woke up one morning and something just felt different. Something had changed. There was this voice calling out. I think it was the artist and it was pleading. It was this thinking, this new thinking that I needed to take care of myself first to learn how to take care of the world around me. And I realized that medicine couldn't be it. And for a while, this decision broke me. I had never figured out how to just let myself be. And I felt so guilty for not following through on something that I knew would help to heal the world around me. It took a long time to realize that, that just by being, just by caring, my existence contributes positively to the world. That's a really hard lesson to learn. I think a lifelong lesson to learn. So after a year in college, I dropped out. I wanted to write music and my school didn't have a program for that. So I told myself I would take a year for myself, write a bunch of music and then apply to schools again. I took the year and wrote a ton of music. I traveled a bit and ultimately I made it into a few programs, but 
looking back, I think I just still wasn't ready. School is expensive and sometimes just too far away from life. Maybe too far away from a life that doesn't feel like it's been fully explored yet. It's a huge commitment and I just wasn't ready. This moment in my life is one that I wish desperately I could communicate with. I was so misguided about what it meant to be an artist, how to be an artist in a relationship to someone else, to myself, to the world around me. And I filled journals and sketchbooks with thought, but there was always this barrier between me and intimate sharing. And that means that this Jacob can't sit down with that one. And that is heartbreaking. So I got into a school for music, but ultimately decided to take another year. I got a mentor out of the whole thing though. The guy who would have become my advisor in school became a friend and I took private lessons from him. Make cool friends and learn things from them. Then I did some more traveling and my first relationship fell apart in large part because I still didn't understand how to be vulnerable. So I was 21 and my understanding of myself as a person and as an artist had cracked and I decided to go back to school for visual art. Maybe that comes as a surprise. It kind of came as a surprise to me as well, but I think it's that my interest in abstraction and the minutia of expression transcends one medium. I've always been so fascinated by composition, regardless of medium, in creating spaces that people can fall into in their own unique ways. That's at the heart of my artistic investigation. And you have something you're investigating too, I'm sure of it. In some ways, our searching is about learning to composite a whole new language from all over. But that can feel frustrating because rarely is there a roadmap. And that's why I'm making this video, to remind you and me that it's okay that the path is winding, that you can't see the end. So I returned to the school near where I grew up and I met the therapist who had helped to put me back together. He was amazing and so, so rad. Get yourself a rad therapist, I'm telling you. He helped me to begin to understand how to view myself and how to value myself. Later on, he became a great friend and a colleague and a collaborator. For the next three years, we're going to move a little faster now. I wrote and sculpted and painted and drew. I collaborated with dancers and I made an artist collective. And it's that interdisciplinary community that helped to teach me how to make something like the dreamscape. But for those three years, I barely picked up an instrument. I was figuring myself out, learning to express in new ways, learning to be vulnerable for the first time. But some things still just weren't there yet. I felt like an outsider all of the time. And in reality, I made that the case. I had a very unique lived experience. And when people would tell me that I was interesting or special, I wouldn't know what to do with that because I still had so many layers of self-worth issues. I wanted so bad to make the world better for those around me, but I never stopped to make the world better for myself. So in my last semester of school, I was preparing my thesis work for two art gallery showings and a performance piece, and I'd applied to schools for my master's degree in fine art. The next part of the story is a bit graphic, but only briefly. If you can bear with me, I'll be delicate. In the evening of February 19th, 2017, a Sunday four years ago, I was gardening at the end of an unseasonably warm day, and I pulled at this grapevine that had wound its way around some shrubs. It snapped back at me incredibly fast, and got me directly in my left eye. I dropped everything and ran inside. I tried to flush out my eye. I felt like there was something in there, like dirt or sand. Nothing worked, so I sat down and wrapped a bandana around my head. My mom was there, thankfully, and she made some calls to get me an appointment for the following day, and we got an ointment to disinfect the eye and ensure that it would stay clean. And then, I sat and I listened. What else could I do? And the world went on around me. The following few days are truly a blur. The grapevine had cut my left eye open and the way that the cornea works is that it's basically this, this tissue under an immense amount of pressure. So when it's sliced, it sort of peels back. This is fixed by flattening the cornea back into place and not using the eye for about a week. But here's the thing about eyes. They work in tandem. They move and dilate together, so I couldn't use either eye for many days. At first, it was really scary. I was incredibly stressed out, but the world went on around me. Now, remember that sound engineer that I had started working with when I was 18? Well, he trained me to be a sound engineer as well, and I'd been practicing listening for over six years, so my hearing was really, really good. Eventually, I relaxed into the darkness, and I just felt everything. It's cliche at this point to say that if you lose one sense, the others become heightened. I think that's often a diminishing generalization, but it's also exactly what happened to me. A few days in, I was still functioning in a state of stress, and I shuffled my way over to my piano. I was alone in the house, and I started playing. It was really hard to peck away at the keys, but I took some time and got reacquainted. I let individual notes that quantum of abstraction wash over me, and it felt like it was washing me. I felt renewed 
How had I gone so long without playing, without listening? It would be absurd to say that in the moment that week felt like anything but hell. And it would be reductionist to say that trauma can or always does or should become the foundation for growth. That is not the case. Trauma is trauma and that's that. Here, I think it wasn't the injury itself, but the way that it interacted with who I had become that really impacted me. I was searching for more, trying to figure out who to become, looking for the next stimulus to get me thinking. I was distracted. Sight is often distracting. I think about it as being the one sense most directly tied to connotation. That when I see an object, I interpret it and I add meaning to what I see. Whereas I don't necessarily do that with a sound or a smell or a taste or a touch. Not as linearly anyway. The nature of sight, it seems, is fairly concrete in contrast to the other four senses. So I'll flash forward a bit now. I began healing. I finished my last semester, had my shows, received a degree in sculpture, and got invited to the Artist to Citizen Conference, a series of workshops run by the nonprofit Artists Striving to End Poverty. I met so many of my artist friends there, so many of which you may now know if you are in the dreamscape. But most importantly, I began to break down that feeling of being an outsider. I started playing with sound again, this time thinking about sound as sculpture, as part of an installation or collaboration with performers, one part of a greater whole. But I also started writing, honestly and vulnerably, treating my voice and my words as a part of my music. I always knew that I could sing, that I had a good voice, but I hadn't really ever let myself just sing for myself. On December 10th, 2017, Nine months after my injury, and incidentally on my birthday, my eye was re-injured, the effect of tending to it less well than I should have. I consider it my hubris incident. I wasn't done realizing that I wasn't taking care of myself, all in the name of taking care of other people. So it was my 25th birthday, and my eye had re-injured itself, and I just felt so defeated, artistically and spiritually. I think I got a lot smaller for a while much more timid. If my eye could re-injure itself once, could it do it again? Was my body just going to begin to unravel? The moments of healing after each injury compounded. It took time to understand that, but they did. The growth and self-discovery that comes from unearthing deep fears like, who would I be if I couldn't fill in the blank? That reverberates through one's being. So after the second injury, I remember beginning to feel the story, that I was starting to understand what this could mean to me. Not so much here is why this happened, but an embracing of my story as my own. And I remember thinking about different philosophies, how in Buddhism, enlightenment is tied to coming to peace within earthly human distractions, and how there are some interesting interpretations of that sort of thing across other cultures as well. The story of Odin, for instance, across the world from Buddhism. He's this wisdom seeker, and there's a part of his story that is so strangely Buddhist. He finds this fountain of wisdom guarded by this wise being, and he asks to drink from the fountain. The being offers a trade. Odin can drink from the fountain if he scoops out his own eye. This idea of removing what makes you human, your connection to the world outside of yourself, to gain something more, it resonated with me. I wondered what it might feel like to take my daily practice, ointment applied to my eye each night so that it wouldn't get re-injured, to remind myself of my connection to both the earth and the cosmos, the world around me, and the world within me. The following summer, August 2018, I released my first album, Within Without. Shortly after that, I met Claire. We started dating and I learned even more about how I could just love myself without restriction, without condition. And then even more music poured out of me, an EP. Tri-State. And now, quite a few of you are a part of this more recent history. Over these last few years, I started collaborating with many of the artists you now see in the dreamscape, writing a score to a play for Brian Matthews, composing a song cycle for Nava Waxman, teaming up with Brandon Havard to create all of this. And all the while, I kept working as a sound engineer, and I kept journaling, and I kept gardening, and traveling, and running, and breathing in the smells of nature. And now, at 28, I find myself wondering about who I am, or who I will be. And I hear myself thinking, shouldn't you have figured this all out by now? If you've ever been in therapy, this might be a familiar feeling to you. I don't think we ever really figure things out. Not in full, anyway. Or. I'll speak only on behalf of myself. I have resolved and re-resolved. I've had eureka moments followed by complete unknowing. And with our art, it's the same. I think it's that our lived experiences, as they are actively lived, contribute to our revisiting old quandaries. It's sort of our charge, I think, to get closer to figuring out our own personal equations. And as artists, it's our charge to share that growth. The reason I wanted to make this video was to remind us that it's okay not to know. There is rarely a roadmap, but it's also to capture how I'm 
feeling right now to be vulnerable here and now in this current state of unknowing. I think it has to do with this year in lockdown, the unraveled world, the distance that the future feels from the present. Only with budding conversations on vaccination have I even gotten any semblance of my future thinking back. And when it came back, my ability to dream and fantasize, it came back flooding in. I've been thinking a lot about who I will be who I could be moving forward. I've been thinking that eventually I'll go back to school, maybe a few years from now. At first, I lived for a while set on going for writing, backed up by all my many thoughts about how that might help my songwriting and help me explore something new. And then I was blindsided, wondering if I should instead go back to visual art to revisit an old friend now as a new person. A few days ago, I was talking with Claire about all of this, and that thing happened where I said something, and then only in hearing myself say it, I realized how true it was. I asked, what kind of artist would I be if I didn't feel like I owed the world something. With my dreaming returned, I will live these futureless days in the skin of a writer and a painter and a touring singer-songwriter and a professor. And I will try to glean what of that I want for myself and how best to get there. The journey of an artist is always non-linear. It is uncertain, confusing, exhausting, but it is also the only life I would ever wish to have. It is true magic to be able to share dreaming with the world around us through what we make. I take that charge very seriously. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video. So my story is only one of billions of stories, yours included, taking place right now. And I would love to hear your story, either here in the comments of this video or over in our art community, The Dreamscape. The link to join The Dreamscape is in the video description. There are also links to the transcript and audio of this video if you prefer only to read or only to listen to what I had to say. If hearing this sort of thing from fellow artists inspires you as much as it inspires me, I hold a resident artist chat series once per month through my Patreon that you may be interested in learning about. These are live audio conversations that you can participate in as a patron, or if you happen to miss it, you can listen in playback. They center the lived experience of one or a few of my colleagues at any one time, and I would consider it something between an interview and a roundtable discussion. They are extremely laid back and so wholesome, and I say with full sincerity that they are my favorite night every single month. The link to check out that series is also in the video description, and I look forward to having you in those chats. Okay, talk to you soon. Bye-bye.